Now, it's good to have you here tonight. Thank you for making the effort to come along. Those who are here for the first time, give you a special word of welcome tonight. Um, I want to just make you aware of, first of all, the meetings next Friday night. We continue to meet in around about a quarter to eight. We just wait for folk to come in. It's that kind of a meeting. Um, so we're, we're uh, trusting to get started in around about eight or just before it uh, next week. The following week, I think, is the 26th. Is that the date? Uh, the 24th. Could you remember on the 24th there are a group, um, they had been in touch with us during the week and uh, this group of believers they have gone over and uh, they, they have a, a burden for revival in Ireland and they have been travelling to each county and they have prayed and uh, been ministering in about 15 or 16 counties. Um, so they contacted us to see was it possible to get the use of the building here on the Friday night uh, on the 24th. So we have uh, said we would introduce them and invite them to come along. And as far as I know, they'll be sharing a little about what has been happening in the counties where they have been in Ireland. I think they give slides. And then there's a man, I think, from Denmark or Holland, I'm not sure, but he's, he's a European. And he'll be coming to, to preach they seem to have a real burden, a genuine burden for revival, and they really believe that God is going to do something very powerful in Ireland. Um, and of course that uh, resonates with many of us here, that God is certainly preparing the land for something wonderful that he's going to do. So if you could remember that uh, uh, on the 24th, and let others know as well, especially those who come along regularly in case uh, they, uh, they, they are not aware. And also, uh, they're hoping to start at half seven that night for the simple reason that we're out at quarter past nine and it does give them a limited time to both share the word and to bring the uh, uh, slides and so on. So if you could remember that uh, and, and put it into your diary for half past seven and let others know uh, it's specifically on the subject of revival in Ireland and that should surely interest uh, all of us, so please remember that. Um, can I say that uh, there are materials that Walter has brought, they're outside on the desk, out on the outer uh, hallway there, they're all free. And then there's CDs down on the right hand side here, uh, on the table down there, and David Leigh uh, was speaking in Loch Brickland on uh, the Ministry of Healing and uh, Inner Healing. And so there are a number of CDs that are there and they're all free. Everything on that, and there's a few of Joyce Meyer speaking on, on, the, on peace, and Paul ran those up. So if there's any of those that you'd like to take, those are all free. But the ones at the back here, uh, Paul uh, gets um, payment for those. So he, he's, he's bringing, he said, he's away at the moment to bring the uh, CDs of last week. So if you would like any of those from last week, he'll have them. Uh, just after the meeting's over. So that's what they look like. Um, I think they're 150 um, for the CDs of, of the Friday nights. And then there's, there's one here that he has called The Pineapple Story. We've mentioned this. I know some of you have listened to it before, but maybe some of you have never. And I would really encourage you uh, to get this uh, uh, CD caught by Otto Conning. Uh, he's he's uh, quite an amazing character, a missionary that went out from America. He was a uh, he was a European, I'm trying to think what country he was from, mm. Holland. Uh, so he, he went out as a missionary uh, to win, win the, uh, uh, these tribal people to the Lord. And it's quite a humorous story, but very powerful. And he tells it just as it is, that he got to the stage where he just hated the people because they kept stealing everything that he owned in his house. They stole his forks, they stole his clothes, they stole and they, they, they wore them themselves. And it's very humorous, but he's been absolutely honest and he just tells how that God dealt with him. And he would go home on furlough to America and he, he, had, he said he was so proud as a missionary, he wouldn't tell them that he was absolutely defeated and he hated the people and he hated the mission field. He was so proud. So he just told them, oh, it's wonderful and God's blessing and all those things that you're meant to say. Uh, but when he went back, he just loathed them. And if you listen to the story, you'll know why it's called the pineapple story, because it was pineapples 
was actually the key that brought him the release, and he became a marvellous soul winner. So uh, I've given you enough by way of introduction, but you'll really enjoy it. And there's a number of those at the back. And then Paul has just run these off. He told me uh, it's called Unless the Lord Builds the House. This is a, a little series, two CDs that we did back a number of months ago, and it's on really building your home, building the family uh, from Psalm 127. So that's in a little box. There's two CDs for five pounds. So there's that and many other materials. You can see them. They're at the back at the left. The free ones are at the right and outside. So please remember all those and uh, hopefully there's maybe something can, can help you. We're going to turn uh, in our Bibles tonight to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. And we'd like to read please from chapter 30. Exodus and chapter 30. Exodus 30 and verse 1. And the Lord is speaking here to Moses uh, concerning the furniture that was in the tabernacle in the wilderness, which was the dwelling place of the Lord in the midst of his people who lived round in tents around this tabernacle. And we're breaking into just but one item. Uh, of furniture that was in that tabernacle. So in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shit and wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length. A cubit's about 18 inches, a foot and a half. A cubit shall be the length of it, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four score shall it be. And two cubits shall be the height thereof, about three foot. The horns thereof shall be of the same. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold about it. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves, or shafts of wood, to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil, that is, by the ark of the testimony, or the covenant, before the mercy seat, that is, over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn their own sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. And uh, it is most holy unto the Lord. Turn over with me now, please, to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation in chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. And we're going to read from verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Don't know if you ever heard of W.P. Nicholson. He said that proved there was no women in heaven. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer, or the bowl, and filled it with fire of the altar. 
and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Amen. We know God will bless the reading of his word. Let's bow in prayer together. Our Father, we want to thank you again for your precious word. And we do ask, Lord, that you will open our minds, our understanding, and our spirit to your truth. I pray, Lord, that you would come amongst us by your Holy Spirit, and that we would become supremely conscious that, that the Lord is here. Lord, I give myself completely to you. I pray that you will cleanse me and sanctify me, and fill me now with the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that in all things your name be glorified, and that tonight, Lord, we would just know that you are working in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In James chapter 5 and 16, the Bible says that Elijah, the prophet of the Old Testament, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and yet he prayed. And it rained not. And then he prayed, and it rained. I want to speak for a little time this evening on prevailing prayer. Prayer that succeeds. Some, one preacher has said, real prayer seeks an audience and an answer. Real prayer seeks an audience and an answer. Many years ago, I remember a preacher coming to a youth event in our church, and he said, you know, over in Europe, we do nothing but pray problems. But in Africa, he said, they pray answers. And sometimes we can spend so much time praying, telling God everything that's wrong, and waste the time. But he said, the Africans, they pray answers. They prevail. To be like Elijah, to have prevailing prayer in our lives or in the group in which we are uh, connected, whether it be a church group or, or a home group or whatever, there needs to be active, devoted, diligent, heartfelt, authentic, and faith-filled prayer. In the passage that we have read together, it breaks into the middle of God's revelation to Moses with this few million people that he had. And I want you to come with me uh, as we begin to, to look at this structure. I want you to see that there's quite a large tent, a kind of a, a fence, a white linen fence, like a curtain, right around this big structure uh, that's, that's quite large, and as you look at it from a distance, there's nothing beautiful about it. It's covered with old badger skins, and it doesn't look particular pretty, but, but that's on the outside. And so all these tents, thousands of tents are positioned. God has told each tribe where they're to be positioned. Everything's ordered by the Lord. Everything to detail. They can't just do what they want and put their tents where they want. God has told them the very positions where this all has to go. And so he, he tells Moses. And if you and I had arrived in the wilderness with all the sand and looked past and got past all these tents, we would have come to a huge big white linen sheet that went right round. It would have been near the height of that ceiling. And you would have looked at that, and you couldn't have got into that building which represented the presence of God ultimately, but you couldn't get in there. And all that struck you when you stood there in that sandy desert was that this white linen is so white, with the sun beaming on it, it's whiter than white. And there was a message conveyed by that to the people, and this was the message, God is holy. God is holy. And you can't get into God. And if you were to go right round that entire uh, circumference of that wall of white, there would just be one door. One door. And one was all that was needed. Because the Lord Jesus is typified in every part of the tabernacle. Everything in that tabernacle speaks 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a young Christian, I went to the brethren and I was in the assembly. And one of the things I learned that I'm grateful for was they said, always look for the Lord in the text. Everything that you're studying, always look for Jesus in the text. And that is especially true when we come to the tabernacle. You see, when we came to that door, and if you would come with me, it's a beautiful door. There's only one. And of course, we know that Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You see, God can't be approached because he's holy. You can't get into God anyway. He's white. He repels us. But he has left a door, and the door is Jesus. And if you entered in through that door, God had positioned the largest piece of furniture. It was called the brazen altar. It was huge, huge. You couldn't have missed it. I mean, if you were blind in one eye, you couldn't have missed it. It was specifically set at the door. And that altar had one symbol, one message primarily to be sent out to everybody that came to the door. And that was sacrifice, death, blood. You couldn't have missed it. And every Jew was taught by that visual image every day of their lives that once you go in through the door, it's going to be not only sacrifice for you, but the sin question can only be dealt with by the shedding of blood. But if you got past that altar and you entered into that big structure that was covered in the, in, in the badger skin, it didn't look like much on the outside. Again, it's, it's quite like the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in Isaiah, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. Jesus was a very ordinary man. He, he didn't stand out in any way. You know, everybody didn't catch on that he was the Son of God. To many, he was just a man. To some people, he was just a madman. But there was nothing about his features that made him stand out. There's no beauty, it says, that we should desire him. It's not until you go inside the tabernacle, then the beauty really appears gold everywhere. And so when you go in to that tabernacle through that door, you would discover on the left-hand side a candlestick with this beautiful light that was spreading out over this area that was, that was dark without that light. Then on the right-hand side, there's a little table with bread. And of course, it speaks of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. But the little bit of furniture I want to draw your attention to is this little box-like piece of furniture that's quite high, three foot tall, and it's right in front of a big curtain. Now, that's, this curtain is so big and so thick that if you put two oxen, two yoked oxen at either side and tied it and tried to pull it, it wouldn't turn two. That's how strong it is. In behind that is what's called the Holy of Holies. That's where God meets. That's where God comes down. There's no natural light. There's no light from the... The only light that ever comes there is when God comes down and the Shekinah, the presence of God, is revealed. And it's full of light only when God comes down. And right in front of that, there's this little piece of furniture. It's called the Altar of Incense. And there the high priest or the priest would come and they would delay. They would bring their sacrifice to God having shed blood been shed. And then they would come and they would take some coal from off the altar that was out at the front, the one with all the cattle being killed, bring some fire from it and bring it in. And then they would take these beautiful little spices and little resins from trees. God told them exactly what it was made up of. And they would bring them all together and they would put them together. And when they did, there would, this smoke would rise up. And it was called incense. And you say, Alan, what in under goodness is that to do with prevailing prayer? 
Well, you see, the altar of incense is the picture of prayer. It's a perfect picture, first of all, of the Lord Jesus himself. You see, it says that that little piece of furniture was made of acacia wood. Acacia wood, or shittim wood, it's called in the, in the, uh, in the authorised. Acacia. Acacia was very common wood, but it was virtually incorruptible. And you see, the acacia wood tells us something about Jesus. It tells us that he was a man. He was a man. It tells us that although he was a man, he was incorruptible. He was sinless. But then it says not only that it was acacia wood, but like other items of the furniture, it was covered with gold. And gold speaks of divinity. And so you have the man who is God. And here is this little item before the great veil, and it speaks of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that this little item of furniture was extremely tall. It was very tall. Three foot in comparison to how narrow it was. The Bible says it had a crown right around it of pure gold. You see, friends, the altar, when you came through the door, that speaks of Calvary. That's where Jesus died. That was brutal. That was the place where blood was shed. That's the place where there was no mercy given from men and where God's wrath was poured out and Jesus became the Lamb of God who was sacrificed. But we know from the scripture that when he died, we know that he rose again. And we know that he is seated at the right hand of the Father and God hath highly exalted him. And in that little piece of furniture that is exalted, we see a crown right around. And we can see it is a picture of the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it speaks to us of his prayer life in heaven. For the Bible says he ever lives to intercede. He's praying always for his church. He's praying always for his people. And his prayers ascend to the Father. Do you remember whenever he stood at, at the grave of Lazarus and he spoke out? Do you remember he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, I know that you always hear me. But he spoke out for the people who were around him. Jesus was always praying. He was always in communion with his Father. And so that altar speaks of Jesus, of his prayer life, and of his prayers that continue to this day. But I want to come for a little time to our prayer life. Because not only does it literally speak of Jesus and his prayer life, but it lays before us very, very practical truths if our prayer life is to prevail. That is, if we are not just to get an audience with the Lord, but also we're to get answers from the Lord. The first thing is that if we want to prevail in prayer, we must come to God by blood. Just as the Israelites and the priests had to come to the altar through the door, through a blood sacrifice, so for us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. And so the blood, we're told in John, that it cleanses us from all sin. We're told then, as, as um, uh, Paul was writing the epistle, he said, we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 
So we come to prayer through blood. You can't get to God any other way. The brazen altar was set so clearly before the people, every Jew knew that blood had to be shed. It was in the DNA of the Jews to understand that. And that's why whenever John the Baptist shouted in the Jordan and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, those people might not fully have understood, but they certainly understood the concept of shedding the blood of a lamb for the forgiveness of sins. So we come by blood. We come by sacrifice. You see, whenever they came to that altar, it was not merely the blood shed for forgiveness of sins, but we know that our Lord Jesus gave everything on the cross. Jesus held nothing back. He gave himself a ransom for many. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, If it be thy will, let this awful dark cup. He could see what Calvary would be. He could see the separation from the Father. He could see the vileness and the filthiness of sin. Everything in him repelled. Everything of his purity, his holiness, his deity. Everything was repelled by what was in that cup that God showed him. And he said, please, let this cup pass. Please make this... This, this go away from me. But, but, if you can't, if there is no other way, nevertheless, thy will be done. And on the cross, Jesus drank the cup, a bitter cup, a filthy cup, a vile cup, a hell-filled cup. He drank it all. He held nothing back. And Jesus said, if you will be my follower, if you will be my disciple, you also must take up the cross. You also must sacrifice. He says in writing to the, Paul in the writing to the Romans, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Psalm 1, 2, 8 and 27, the psalmist says, Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Not only give yourself unconditionally to God, but keep yourself on the altar. I can remember being converted at 17 years of age. At 21, God began to work in my life as a Christian. And in around that period, I can remember the Holy Spirit dealing with me as I was just seeking God in my life. And God brought me to a very clear, definite moment in my life when he very specifically said, Alan, you have your own ambitions, you have your own dreams, you have things you want to do, you have things you want to achieve, you must choose to let them go. You must choose to die to self. You must choose and make it firm and stick with it that you're going to follow the Lord come what may. And God calls us all to that moment in our lives. The Holy Spirit draws us to that moment. And then thereafter, by his grace, he calls us to bind ourselves to the altar that we stay upon it and stay yielded to him. And so to prevail in prayer, we must come by blood to the Lord. We must come by sacrifice and by complete yieldedness to the Lord. One of the things I discovered in my Christian life was until the Lord had complete control of every area of my life, prayer was a pretty monotonous experience, and it was quite purgatorial to me, 
something that I just had to do. But I certainly didn't get an audience with the Lord, and I certainly didn't get answers. But I discovered once I was prepared to lay down on the altar, things began to change. Answers started to come. What we find from this little altar that was at the front, in front of the great veil, we find that on top of it there was this little gold, little, little crown and four horns coming out of the top, all covered in gold. And what we discover as we read it is that there's an element of mystery because we're told with such detail what happened with regard to the other altar, but there are elements of mystery regarding this little table. There are things that we would love to know regarding the mixing, regarding how it was done, how the priest did it in detail, what depth it was down, the center of it was down in. Many details, if you studied it, that you'd want to know. But it's mysterious. We're not told. You see, my dear friends, the Bible tells us that we know not how we ought to pray. There's a mystery about prayer, you know. We don't know how to pray. But the Bible says the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. You see, whenever the priest came to this little item of furniture and stood before it, he would take the coals of fire live coals, red coals. And he would somehow take them and set them on the altar. And then he would take this beautiful resins, these spices, and he would mix them all together and grind them into powder. And then he would put them on the fire. And then something happened. There was this ascending, this smoke began to rise up when that happened. And when you and I come to prayer, we're really in the same predicament. I mean, if you just prayed at the altar and you came and you just started to talk, really that's not going to achieve very much. You see, for prevailing prayer, you're going to need two things to attend your prayers. One is fire and the other is incense. You need both of them if it's going to ascend. You see, God doesn't answer all prayer. I haven't time to preach on that tonight, but there are many texts in the Bible where the Bible says God doesn't answer prayer. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I'm living in sin and I'm unprepared to deal with that sin, God doesn't answer my prayers. In fact, he doesn't even hear them according to that psalm. So God doesn't have to listen to as many prayers as we think he does, because if our hearts are not right, if we're not prepared to deal with sin, it's a real problem for prayer becoming any way effective. And so there's fire. It's interesting when God told the disciples in the upper room, uh, and the Lord told them beforehand, he said, you know, whenever the Holy Spirit comes, he said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire, with the Holy Ghost, and with fire. And so here the priest stands before the place where prayer is going to be offered to God, and as prayer is being offered, the people of God are praying without. As they're praying, so the fire comes. And we need the fire of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit to come and to deal with this sin, to come and purge. That's what it does. It purges, it cleanses, it purifies the fire. And then, of course, there's the beautiful fragrance of the frankincense, and that, that puts out a beautiful fragrance out, out over all. And friends, whenever a man or woman prays in the Holy Ghost, whenever a man or woman is moving in the Holy Ghost, there's not only a fire in their life, but there's a fragrance in their life as well. It's like A.W. Tozer said, when the Holy Ghost rests on a man and woman, God gives them a face. He said, the world is going about with millions of people and they have no face. In other words, there's no identity. They're just part of the, the human masses that are just moving. Purposeless, 
living for vanity. But he said when a man or woman meets God, he said they get a face. God marks them. God marks them. And we'll see before the message is over that God marks the man or woman of prayer perhaps more than anybody else. You see, friends, not only is there a mystery regarding prayer, but the Word of God makes it clear to us that there must be holiness in our lives for prayer. Turn with me, please, to 1 Chronicles 23. 1 Chronicles 23. And verse 13. Speaking here of the high priest, Aaron, and his sons who would ultimately be responsible for this work that was going on inside the tabernacle, they would become very familiar with all that we're talking about just now. And in verse 13 of First Chronicles 23, we read the sons of Amron, Aaron and Moses. Listen to it. And Aaron was separated or sanctified or made holy. that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his son forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name forever. Do you notice that? That the Lord separated him and his sons so he could burn incense before the Lord. He couldn't burn incense until he was separated. He couldn't be effective with incense or in the service of God in prayer until he had been made holy and set aside by the Lord. The Bible says to us in Peter, Be ye holy, even as I, the Lord, am holy. The Bible says, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. In 1 Timothy, in chapter 2 and 8, when Paul is exhorting young Timothy, starting out in a new fellowship, he says, talking of the Christian men in the church, he said, men ought to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Lifting up holy hands that the hands and the heart are right with God. He says men should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, temper, anger, frustration, and doubting. Well, there's two things that can really bring problems to prevailing prayer. God says you need to lift up holy hands, but he said you need to deal with wrath. If there's wrath or temper in your life, he said that's going to abort the praying. He said if there's doubting and unbelief in the heart, it's going to abort the prevailing prayer. The Christian life has to be a life of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Someone has said none can pray well, but he that lives well. You'll never find a person who's great in prayer who's bad at living. You'll never find a man or woman who's full of the Holy Spirit in prayer who's not being transformed in their personal lives. One is interlinked and locked with the other. You can't have one without the other. And so God calls you and I not only to be sanctified to him and to enter and engage in prayer, but to trust the Lord for his purity. You say, well, Alan, how could I be holy? I am unholy. I'm conscious of sin. I'm conscious of failure. I'm conscious of so many areas of my life where, where there is failure. Well, my friends, you find yourself in the same dilemma as, as I'm in. And all I can do for you is what I do for myself, and that is I can call to your attention the promises of God. 
where the Scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5, the very God of peace sanctify or set you apart through and through. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I learned many years ago as a Christian, if God calls you to do something, he'll give you the ability to do it. Whatever he asks you to do, no matter how awkward, difficult, or impossible it is in your mind, if God calls you to do it, God will give you the enabling to do it. The, that's all you need is God's calling, and God's enabling will come. So holiness God calls us to. But then we find something interesting about this little tabernacle or this little uh, item of furniture. We discover in chapter 30 and verse 6, Thou shalt put it before the veil, and where the testimony is, and in verse 7, And Aaron shall burn their own sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense with it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, and a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You see, this fire that was being used for to ignite uh, this uh, powder form of incense to create this cloud that was ascending and producing a beautiful fragrance into the whole atmosphere of the tabernacle and going out into the outer court where people would smell it. So as this was going on, the fire that was used every day had been ignited by the Lord. It was the Lord who lit the fire. It wasn't lit by, lit by men. It wasn't the priests who lit it. They didn't have matches. They didn't have fire lighters. It was the Lord who lit the fire, and the fire continued. The fire never went out. The fire was maintained by the Lord supernaturally. But what they had to do was they had to maintain the fire. And so what he would do is every day the priest would go in early in the morning and late in the evening. And he would go to the lamps. And I want you to notice this. He would go to the lamps first. And what he would do is he would remove the little bits of wick that were killing, killing the light, killing the fire. And he would remove and dress it. And he would do each of them until it was nice and bright. And when he had got max light. When the light had been so vastly improved, then he would go, and he would go to the altar. And you might see, my friend, if you want to prevail in prayer, you must walk in the light. If you come to prayer to break through with God, then you must be constantly walking in the light as he is in the light. Very often, I've said this before, but you can detect in a church prayer meeting whether people are really walking in the light or not, whether they are improving the light. Because when a person prays the same prayer all the time, year in, year out, then that shows me there's something wrong. Light is not doing its work. You see, once the light comes, then we can see differently. We can see things in our lives that the Lord doesn't like, and we will pray accordingly. And so our prayers change. And as the fire and the incense hit the prayer, so we pray perhaps in a different way, in a different direction. Our prayers are never the same. They're never the same because they're ignited by the Lord. And so this prayer was morning and evening. It never stopped. What does the Bible tell us? Men ought always to pray and not to faint. One of the great problems with prayer is we are curtailed by fainting. One of the great drawbacks in persistence in prayer is the world, the flesh, and the devil call us to give up. Jesus said, pray lest ye enter into temptation. You see, round the top of that little piece of furniture, there were four horns speaking always in the Bible of strength. And Jesus said, you need to stay at the altar. You need to stay at the place of prayer, for strength is at the altar. 
Show me any person who has departed from prayer, and I'll show you someone who's on the road to backsliding and away from God in their heart. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. You see, friends, if you turn with me very quickly to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 10, I beg your pardon. Chapter 10 and verse 4. This is where Cornelius, a Gentile, is receiving the Holy Spirit after the great uh, move of God in Pentecost when the Jews, uh, God came upon the Jews in the day of Pentecost. This is the Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out upon them now. And this man, God finds him in his home. He's, he's a very important man. He's an influential man. But he's not a Jew. He's not a Jew. He's in his home. And an angel comes to his home. Wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? An angel turns up at his home. Why would the angel turn up at Cornelius' home and not his neighbor? I'll tell you why. Verse 4. And when he looked, that is, when Cornelius looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms, or thy giving, are come up for a memorial before God. While this man was praying at his altar and hanging on to the horns of the altar in prayer, and when he was utilizing his own resources to give to others, he didn't fully understand it. He didn't grasp the full significance of it. But in the spirit world, there was something rising up from Cornelius's house that wasn't going up from other houses. The angels could see it. The demons could see it. But men couldn't see it. You see, friends, when you go back to home, that home might be very, very important in the eyes of the world. It may be very wealthy. There may be great uh, 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 beauty and so on and gardening and whatever it might be around it. And you could go past that and say, that is some place. That really is, whoa, that is powerful. <laughs> but in the spirit world, as angels would walk up and down the road, they would walk past that house and say, that's nothing. That's insignificant. That's unimportant. But maybe come to a tiny little cottage where there's not very much about it, but there's a little man or a little woman or a family, and they're at the altar. They're seeking God. They're praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're giving to God, and there's a cloud rising up out of that home. You see, this ascends, this, this prayer from this altar, it goes up and it leaves a beautiful fragrance. And what we read in, in the book of Revelation chapter 8 was that the angels took the prayers of the saints and put them in a goblet or a bowl or a big cup container. And they brought them up. And what, what the angel did was he took this incense in heaven. Because what happens in the tabernacle on earth is mirrored in heaven. That's actually in heaven. And, and they took the incense, loads of it, and poured it in on the prayers. And the Bible says this beautiful incense goes right up into the throne room of God. Right up into the presence of God. You see, my dear friends, it seems to me from the Bible that only prayer can do this. Only prayer can do this. That this can rise up and go right before the throne room and before the four creatures, the great heavenly beings mentioned in, in Revelation 8, and the 24 elders before the throne. That, that this is rising up and this is having an amazing effect. 
and there's a fragrance that is going into heaven, into heaven. Now, when we are praying, prevailing prayer, God told something very quickly. And if you turn with me again back to chapter 30, because God made a covenant, and this is very important. This is very important. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 6. This is what the Lord said. And thou shalt put it before the veil, that is the little ark, or that little uh, uh, incense, in front of the testimony, in front of the Ark of the Covenant. He said, Thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the Ark of the Covenant, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony. There I will meet with thee. Ah, something happens when we are at this altar. Something can happen in my life. Not only does this ascend to the throne and does it fill heaven with a fragrance, but something happens on earth. Not only does something happen in heaven, but something happens on earth. God said, I will meet you there. Lovely little word. I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar, but the Hebrew word is Yaad. Yaad. That's what me, I will Yaad you there. <laughs> what does it mean? It means I will meet you there at that spot. It means I have made an appointment. God said, I have made an appointment, and whenever you are there, God said, I'll be there. It means that you and I will meet together. You see, friends, it kind of rolls over into the New Testament, doesn't it? Where Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. I will Yahweh, I will meet you. You ever in private prayer or, or in a church prayer meeting where, where uh, Yah, uh, Yah the ans- actually happened, Yah, where God actually meets you? Where you actually encounter God? You see, for the modern evangelical church in our land, this is foreign language. This is un- misunderstood. That's why the average church today, their, their, their prayer meetings are woeful or virtually non-existent. And yet I'm told all the time of these churches that they're all on fire for God. That's what I'm told. They're all on fire. They're not on fire, most of them. Many of them, where you see a lot of people buzzing about, it's like lemonade. You know the way you get a tin of lemonade or a little Coke tin and you give it a good old shake? And then you pull the lid. It's not on fire, it's the Coke. That's, that's where a lot of it is. It's just a lot of fizz and bubble and nothing behind it. That's what it is. You see, dear friends, There was a day in a past generation when the people in our province, Christians, what they did was they met in their churches, and you know what they would do? They would pray all night. All night. It was not unregular. It was not uncommon. All night. Do you know what would happen as they prayed all night? The Lord would meet with them. That's why they wanted to keep meeting. But you see, if you've never really been meeting God, if that hasn't been happening in prayer, what appetite would you have to meet for more prayer? What appetite would you have to really seek God anymore? Whenever there's nothing really happening, there's no big benefits from it. But oh my friend, God says, when you do this the way I'm telling you, and you come with the fire and the incense at the altar, God says, at that place I will meet you. You see, that little altar of incense of prayer was the closest piece of furniture to the Shekinah. It was the closest. It was the nearest to God. And when you're in prayer, that's your nearest. 
to God at your nearest. And so God makes a covenant. He said, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you there. So this prayer ascends and it fills heaven and it comes up before the Lord and the elders take it in great bowls and they put the incense in it and it rises up wonderful <laughs> and we meet with God wonderful you see we, we said at the beginning real prayer seeks an audience with God God says I'll meet you that's an audience with God <laughs> When the Lord comes down in, in personal prayer or collective prayer, that's an audience with God. You have God in the midst. And when God comes down in a prayer meeting, my dear friend, you will know he has come. You will never need. I remember many years ago, one of the first times I encountered God in this way. I remember being at a prayer meeting. I was about 21 or two years of age. And I was very, very young and inexperienced in many ways. But there were older saints. There was a, a, an Elam man. He used to come. He loved singing. He was a lovely man. He used to come. And he would sing a lot. And then there was a brethren and there was a Baptist. And there were really a dolly mixtures, all kind. But we were all meeting together to pray. To ask God to work in our community and ask him to work in our lives. And I can remember one particular morning that sticks out. And all I can say is as we were praying, the presence of God descended into that tiny little room. And there was an old broken picture and a tilly lamp. There was no electric. An old super, sir, that was cutting on and off. There was nothing wonderful about the building. But the Lord came down. And I remember feeling in my heart, I really feel I need to kneel. Just feel I need to kneel. And I quietly turned round on my knees. And when I looked round, all the other men had all done the same. And then I heard my Pentecostal friend beginning to pray and to talk. And I looked round at him, and the tears were running down his face. And he said, God is here. God is here. He didn't need to tell any of us. If God's there, you never need to announce it. You never need to announce it. Everybody knows when God's there. Our problem is we are not encountering God the way that we could or the way that we should. Let's conclude. Turn over with me in closing to the book of Romans or Revelation again in chapter, chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. The prayers have now ascended. In verse 4 it says, And the smoke of the incense, that's the prayer, Re Revelation 8 verse 4 and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand and so here we have this prayer going up and it's in the censer look at it, verse 5 and the angel took the censer that's where the prayer is a bowl, that's what it means. Either a bowl or, or some kind of a, an instrument to, to hold and carry the prayers. And it says that, he, that, that in verse 5, And the angel took the censer that was before the Lord, and he filled it with fire of the altar. This is heaven's altar. This is, this is heaven's altar. This is heavenly fire. And so the angel takes the heavenly fire, uh, and what he does with it in verse uh, 5 is he, he, he fills where the prayers, where the incense are, he, he fills that vessel with fire. And the Bible says when he does it, he casts it into the earth. It's thrown, it's, it's hurled down. This, this is the prayers of the Lord's people where they have prevailed in prayer, where they have met with God. Now, this has come up before God as a sweet sense, but God hasn't stopped there. That's not the end of it. They have encountered God, but, but something more has to happen. You see, it's not enough just to have an audience with God. You need to have an answer from God. And so what they do is the angel takes the fire from the altar, puts it in on the incense and the prayers, and then 
Satan throws it, empties out this vessel, this bowl, this goblet. He, he pours it out and throws it down on the earth. And the Bible says when he does it, there are voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. When this happens, my friends, when God begins to answer prevailing prayer, first of all, there is judgment on Satan. God judges the enemy. He puts his fire on the enemy. In the Isle of Lewis, the time that the revival was about to break forth, the two old ladies renowned for praying during that revival in 1949, it is stated that as the power of God was coming on that island, as Duncan Campbell was being drawn up to be the primary evangelist, that the two old ladies heard in the spirit world, they heard Satan shouting, retreat. You see, the judgment of God came on the enemy. But not only did that happen as the Lord sent forth his thunderings and his fire and his earthquake, but also the heavens, heaven's power is demonstrated on earth. Literally, heaven comes down to earth when the Lord answers prayer when the bowl or the vial, whenever the goblet is emptied with the fire in it, it comes down on earth and God's power is manifested. Samuel Chadwick was a great author. If you ever get the chance to read any of his books, I encourage you to buy them. Samuel Chadwick said this, the one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at her toil, he mocks at her wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, for the calling on every life of every Christian to become a man or woman of prayer. We thank you for such a wonderful calling, such a wonderful privilege given to all of us. We ask, Lord, that in our homes, that in our lives, that as angels and demons, look on, that there would be a steady cloud of incense arising, and that, Lord, your blessing, your fire, your grace would be poured forth We thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing. And we praise you tonight, Lord, in expectation of all the wonderful things that you are going to do as you begin to pour out your blessing on this land of ours. Part us now, Lord, in your fear and with your blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and thank you so much for listening.